Welcome to this, our last talk as part of the Eastern Cloisters project entitled A Cloister's House Through Time. And the reason that I wanted to do this talk is that the house that I'm standing in, which is today number 12, also sort of part of 13 and 14, is one of the most interesting houses in the cloister because as part of the research and the archaeology that we have done for the Eastern Cloisters project, we have found all sorts of things out about the residents and the people that lived and set fire to this bit of the cloister. And the first thing I wanted to show you is this amazing wall painting. The cloisters that we stand in today were built in 1475 to house our vicar's choral and the vicar's choral were men who sang in the cathedral and didn't like having to come back and forth to the cathedral several times a day for services. So they persuaded the bishop to build them this amazing cloister to live in. When they arrived there were 27 dwellings, one for each of the vicar's choral and each one was a bit like a room in university halls, all exactly the same, all kind of neutral. but. The men, if they had the inclination and the money, could decorate their dwelling according to their own taste. And this wall painting here, amazingly preserved, is from the early 1500s. So possibly not the first resident in this dwelling, but probably the second. And this man has chosen to have this incredible design painted on his walls. It is amazing that this has survived for so many centuries. As we go through other rooms, you'll see that other parts of the uh, house are panelled. Some of them were wallpapered after that and around that. But this little bit here has survived all the way through the centuries, giving us a glimpse into what this cloister's house looked like when it was very first built. After those initial men moved in in 1475 and decorated their lodgings according to their own taste, Life potted on in a similar fashion for centuries here in the cloisters. The main difference in terms of the building occurred in the 16th century when the number of vicars choral was reduced from 27 down to 12. Because all of a sudden there were fewer men living in the cloisters, some of the men chose to knock through into the empty house next door to make their own house bigger. Sometimes they even had the nerve to then build dean and chapter for the work. But the main change to this particular part of the cloister here at the house we're looking at occurred in this corner in the 1820s. There were a series of arson attacks here in the cloisters. A chorister called Robert Carpenter was arrested. Now, records from Hereford Assizes show that he was never actually charged, so we don't know if he was guilty or not. We do know that he mended his ways and he became a respected teacher and his son Thomas became a lay clerk by the 1850s. So clearly they forgave him in the cloister. But a later fire in the 1820s had a significant effect on the college both in terms of the building and the people. Because in the summer of 1828 this corner here was set on fire. They didn't know if it was an accident or arson, but by the time anyone noticed, the fire had really taken hold of this corner. John Constable, the butler, was concerned about the college plate stored in these houses. The plate was all the silverware, the valuables that belonged to the college. So John rushed in to try and save the plate. Unfortunately, the stairs collapsed beneath him with the fire and he was stuck inside upstairs. People rallied round and managed to get him out of a top window, but unfortunately he had inhaled too much smoke and he died a few days later at the infirmary. The vicars blessed them, looked after John's wife and child for some time after his death. They made sure that they were looked after. But this particular part of the college had suffered a lot of damage. The corner was burnt, had to be repaired, and that took several years to make up for the damage from that fire. It was a significant period of time here for the cloisters. In the 1830s and 1840s, the cloisters and the chapel were renovated and repaired after the fire. One of the most amusing finds of the cloisters project and the archeology span that we did here were these bits of bottle. Now, the bottles were found outside this house, hidden, under the doorstep along with some bones and shells, indicating that someone had been having a party. 
the bottles date from the 19th century so it may be that these things came from the builders who were doing the post-fire repair work or it may have been the vicars having a party of their own. What we do know is that the vicars drank so much and were in trouble for this so often and spent far too much money that by 1843 a new rule was brought in saying that servants were limited to how many times they were allowed to be sent out for ale each day to try and keep the vicars a bit more sober. So these bottles may well have been from when the vicars were sneaking in wine and beer that they shouldn't have done into the cloisters. As well as the post-fire repair work going on in the cloisters in the mid-19th century, there was a lot of repair work to the old chapel and to the rooms either side of it. The chapel was starting to fall down at the far end, and so the decision was made to shorten the room and at the same time remove the mezzanine floor that had been put in to house the library. The library books were taken out and stored in some of the houses either side of the chapel. We're not sure which because the numberings all changed quite a lot over the years. But the library floor was taken out and the doorway between number 12 and the chapel was also removed. During building work up in the roof of the cloister house, we could see the original doorway still in the beams. The chapel itself, in its new restored and slightly smaller state, so the size that we have today, was then used remarkably for cathedral services. It's hard to picture it today, but the cathedral was being restored just after the chapel. And so while the clergy couldn't use the cathedral for services, they used our chapel. Now, I love our old chapel, and as part of the Eastern Cloisters project, we have renovated it, and it is a beautiful, multi-purpose, accessible space. But it still, at best, holds about 30 people. So how they managed to squeeze cathedral services into the chapel, I have no idea. So the chapel became a very separate space from the cloister house during this time and the cloister house started to become home to not only vicars but vicars and their families. After the renovation of the old chapel in the 1940s and the renovation of the cathedral we know that the men who lived in these rooms here in the cloister spent an awful lot of time arguing about who was going to live in which room and what we know from our act book is that number 12, so the house that we're in right now, was one of the most desirable because in 1842, this is the house that the Custos choose, chose to have as his house. And the Custos was the vicar choral who was in charge of the other vicars. So he would have picked almost certainly the nicest house for himself. As time went on, some of the other vicars got annoyed that they didn't have bigger rooms or nicer rooms, and two vicars in particular, John Goss and Francis Havergill, spent an awful lot of time complaining about the rooms that they were given to live in. Goss and Havergill were assistant vicar choral, so they were slightly below some of the other vicars, and they got annoyed any time that they were overlooked or not treated as equals. And in the end, Havergill ends up in this house. So by 1855, he is in number 12. Francis Havergill was definitely a determined man. And I think he's one of the most interesting characters that lived here in the cloister. He was a little pernickety, but you could also just see him as diligent. He invested a lot of time into researching the history of the cathedral and the city and the county and even went so far as to record every monument in the cathedral and its grounds in 1882. That took an awful lot of hours of research and trying to decipher gravestones and plaques. So he really did care about the history, but I get the impression that he was a little difficult to live alongside as a neighbour. After he left here in the cloisters, he continued to come back and do his research and we know that in one of the later censuses he's recorded as staying with the Dean so that he can carry on his research here. After Francis Havergill left number 12, we know that almost certainly the next family to move in was the Duncan family and it was a family, which is interesting, they are one of the first few families to live here in the cloister. As time went on, priests were allowed to marry and they moved in with their wives and also their children. And here, the Duncan family lived for a very long time, we think around 40 years. And in that time, they definitely made themselves at home. The fireplace behind me is just one of the very elaborately decorated fireplaces that they had installed here in the house in the cloister. 
So behind me you will see all sorts of crests painted on the woodwork. They represent the cathedral and the diocese, but also the Duncan family. So he really put his mark on his house. Another lovely feature of this fireplace is the Godwin tile display that you can see behind me. Godwins were a local tile manufacturer who were really popular in the mid to late 19th century. And here is a really lovely display of their work. What's wonderful is that these tiles had previously been painted over with very dark black paint, but Upon coming into number 12 one day, I noticed a little corner of one of the tiles. The paint had chipped off and I could see the very distinctive kind of ready orange of a Godwin tile. And the builders very kindly took a little bit more of the paint off to see what was underneath and found the first Godwin tile. The site foreman Luke then spent a whole day uncovering the tiles for us. So we have this incredible display behind me. It shows the kind of personality that the Duncans had, that they invested this much time and money into making the house their own. And I think it's really lovely to picture them gathered around the fireplace as a family, noticing their own family crest on the mantelpiece above them. So thanks to the decoration in the cloisters, we really had a fairly good idea of the kind of people that the Duncans were. But as part of the restoration work to the cloisters, the builders went into the roof eaves of number 12 and 14. And in doing so, they uncovered a whole horde of finds left there by the Duncan family. And we know it was definitely the Duncans, not only because the timelines match up, but because they left their name on some of the items. We have got packets of chocolate boxes. We have half-finished macrame. We even have a box left over from their Christmas cards after they'd finished writing their Christmas cards on Christmas. We have managed to find a card that is from exactly the same company and the same year as the box that we found in the attic, which gives you a lovely idea of the kind of cards that they were writing. But without question, one of the most exciting finds from the attic belonged to Isabel Duncan, the daughter. This is an issue of the Common Cause from 1911 and we found a selection of issues of the Common Cause all marked with Miss Duncan in the corner and it's just incredible because we know that it wasn't just William therefore that cared about suffrage but his wife and his daughter as well and further research showed us that both his wife and daughter were involved in lots of meetings and campaigns around the country for suffrage but I just think this is amazing that this has survived for so many years intact and is now safely stored in our archive. After the Duncan family moved out, we aren't entirely sure who lived here over the next few decades, but we know that by the 1960s, Ted Parnell and his family had moved into this house. Ted was a verger at the cathedral for many years and as part of the Eastern Cloisters project we had the honour of interviewing him for our oral history archive. Ted told us lots of lovely stories about the Queen visiting and people getting dressed up for special occasions and the kind of festivities that surrounded the Three Choirs Festival. What I didn't expect from Ted's interview and I think is really lovely is that his interview about quite recent times in the cathedral and the cloister helped to illuminate some of the past actions by cloister residents. So Ted told us how he was living here with his wife and two daughters and he really struggled to have enough room for his daughters just to do their homework and spend time and have their own space. So they added in this top floor. We know that the cloisters started to have floors added to them from the 19th century, from around 100 years before Ted was here. But Ted's example of why he did it, because of his extending family all needing their own room, made sense of those past vicars as they moved in with their wives and children, and they needed more room than just the men who used to live here on their own. I think that reflection back and explaining of the past through modern eyes is really lovely and something we didn't really anticipate. Ted also told us a particularly lovely story that helped us to understand the 19th century a bit better. Ted told us, as part of a meeting I had with him before his interview, that when he lived here, there was a cupboard door 
that had 1862 written on it. And because he could see that it was old and probably important, he didn't paint over it. And he wondered if the door was still there. He left several decades ago. So the following morning I came down to site and I asked the builders if I could look for a door. They were a little confused but said yes, why not? And I came in and I had a look. And I found the exact same door that Ted talks about here still in the cloisters. And it is marked 1862 and then it has a hop yield for each month of that year. Either harvesting the hops or brewing the beer, you can't quite tell but you know that the gallons of beer produced at the end are definitely recorded, which is in keeping with everything we know about the Vickers Choral and their desire to drink. But when I saw Ted the following week at our Cloisters reunion, I was able to show him the door that he had so carefully looked after through the 20th century that was still intact today. And if Ted hadn't told us about it, I don't know if we'd have found that little bit of graffiti hidden on a door. But it gives a really lovely window into what life was like here in the 19th century. In that kind of way, the oral history and the research and the archaeology and the building work have all come together on this project. All of us have worked collaboratively to help fill in each other's gaps. The archivist has helped us understand some things and the builders on site and craftspeople have helped us understand other things. And all of these elements of the Eastern Cloisters project have come together to help us understand the history of our cloisters, their residents and the College of Vickers Choral far better than we could have anticipated. We are just incredibly grateful to our funders, including the National Lottery Heritage Fund, for supporting this project and making it possible. We hope that by doing this restoration work we have made sure that this cloister's house and the rest of the cloisters are safe for many more years to come.